Hey, you. You're finally awake. Really wish I wasn't. Hello and welcome back to my channel, now under a new name. About two weeks ago, a few of us in the Pixel Talk Discord server, link in the description as always, collaboratively came up with an idea with a simple but fun premise. What is the minimum viable Skyrim machine? That is to say, what is the worst machine that you can actually run and play Skyrim on? After extensive talking and tech shit posting, we settled on our criteria. One, it shall be played on the original version of Skyrim, not the special edition. Two, set whatever graphics settings you have to, including .ini file edits, but no mods are allowed. Three, the goal is to complete the Unbound quest, the first one in the game. In other words, you need to successfully escape Helgen. Four, the person with the most ridiculous setup that completes the above wins. As for what does most ridiculous mean exactly? Eh, who knows. But obviously the winning play here is to go as slow as possible. Which brings up the related question, how old can you go? You would think that eventually you would run into some missing feature that Skyrim requires, right? That'd be correct. Let's talk about what Skyrim has as its minimum requirements. No, not the official minimum requirements, but the real minimum requirements that the game needs to run at all. On the CPU, you need SSE 1 instructions. That is to say, the bottom limit is Pentium 3, Athlon XP, or VSC 3. Going even older could be possible with instruction emulators, but that's cheating. On the GPU, you need DirectX 9.0C. Emphasis on the C. Sadly, you're not going to run it on early DX9 GPUs like GeForce FX or Radeon 9000 series. No, Skyrim needs Shader Model 3 support, meaning your options start at GeForce 6000 and Radeon X1000. You also need 256 meg of VRAM unless you really crater the game resolution and play with the config files some. As for RAM, we don't actually know for sure. It may actually depend on other system components. Others have had issues even starting the game with 1GB of RAM, while I've already proven that it can technically run on 1GB, and that's even shared between the system and the GPU. With that in mind, Obviously, the winning play is going to be some Pentium 3 machine with a GeForce 6200 or an ATI X3100, right? Well, maybe? But it's no fun if we all go for the same obvious choice. Someone's got to be more creative than that. So, what do I have instead? What about an old Lenovo shitbox? This is a Lenovo Idea Center H215, a basic home desktop from 2010 that promises stability, quality, and ease of use. No promise of high performance though, which is how we know we're in the right place. Inside the box we find exactly what you expect to find in a machine like this. This is a socket AM3 machine featuring an Athlon 2 X2 215. This is a decidedly newer chip than those minimum viable CPUs I mentioned earlier. Two complete architectures ahead of the Athlon XP even. But I promise there's a method to my madness. This is one of the slowest dual-core K10 chips on offer. And it's, well, dual-core. On a platform that offers up to six cores. But this chip is still plenty capable of running Skyrim. Now we're getting to the fun part. I'm sure almost everyone has long since noticed that there's no graphics card in here. AM3 chips don't have integrated graphics either. Of course, this means that the graphics solution can only be found on the motherboard. Sure enough, this motherboard uses the AMD 760G chipset, where G is for graphics. In particular, G is for Radeon 3000 graphics. In classic AMD fashion, this integrated GPU is based on an aging discrete GPU design. In this case, it's based on RV610, 
a member of the Terrascale 1 family with a shader count of only 40 and a everything else count that you could do on your fingers. This is the core originally found in the Radeon HD 2400 Pro, a card known for even worse performance than you would expect due to its extremely limiting 64-bit DDR2 memory bus. Back on the Radeon 3000 iGPU, we find this core also feeding from a 64-bit DDR2 bus that is also on the other side of the hypertransport bus to the CPU. Oh, and the core clock is way lower than on the 2400 Pro. Clearly we're looking at a very high-performance graphics solution. As for the RAM, it's running 4GB of DDR2-1066. Admittedly, this is overkill for this machine, but I chose to focus solely on GPU misery rather than murdering an old hard drive with constant page file swapping. But that's enough talking about parts. Time to show what they can do. For this video, I will be running the game at 1080p low with no custom changes to the settings. Given that the discrete version of this graphics core could only run Oblivion at 15 frames per second at a lower resolution, this is going to be a fun time. Also, apologies if the video framing seems a bit weird, but Skyrim was absolutely convinced that my capture setup does not support 1080p, so I had to run it in windowed mode to force it to run at that resolution anyway. Now starting the timer, we also start our first bout of waiting for the game to load. This will become a pattern. In real time, this screen takes nearly three and a half minutes, but obviously I've sped it up here. I may have failed to mention earlier that the game is running off a 15 year old 5400 RPM hard drive. Hey, you, we're finally awake. Though as I joked at the beginning, that may not actually be preferable. As we start the cart ride, note that we're seeing a frame rate around four to five frames per second. We're also seeing the GPU usage absolutely pegged at 100%, and the CPU is just kind of wondering what's the big holdup. Like I said, dual core K10 doesn't have any major trouble with Skyrim. That doesn't stop the voice lines from being massively desynced from their animations, however. Hey, you. Finally awake. You were trying to cross the border, right? On a machine like this, any sort of interaction with the game is a challenge. Even moving the mouse during the cart ride is painful. What you can't see in the recording is that on top of the abysmal frame rate, there is even more abysmal input delay. At this point, that delay is one or two seconds. In later parts of the run, it can get even worse. You can probably understand why I leave the mouse in one place for most of the cart ride. It's also worth mentioning that if you were to run Skyrim on a severely CPU limited rather than GPU limited system, the symptom that you get is a lot weirder than low frame rate. Skyrim physics are very reliant on the tick rate, or how often the physics calculations are being performed. If the CPU gets bogged down, so does that tick rate. Even in the best of cases, Skyrim is a pretty buggy game, but if that tick rate falls too far, all hell breaks loose. Many of us during preparations for this challenge experienced the personal carts breakdancing and then eventually getting stuck in the wrong place in Helgen, soft locking the game. Why do you think? End of the line. Another four minutes later, we finally reach the end of the line, and we can get off our wild ride. And we go through more waiting. Though in a moment you get to see a fun little physics bug where our favorite thief from Rorikstead actually gets away from the archers and runs off into the distance for a happy life. No, I'm not a rebel. You can't do this. Halt! You're not going to kill me. Archers! Anyone else feel like 
like running? Who are you? With that out of the way, we can finally fulfill our dreams of becoming a cat, give ourselves a name, and find out that the captain must be a filthy dog person instead. And now we wait. Again. And this one takes a while. We do get another fun physics glitch with the first person to the block, however. You imperious bastard! Oh hey look, a dragon! Once the game has taken its time giving everyone a fresh pair of underpants, we finally get to walk around, and immediately realize that the input delay that applied to the mouse also applies to everything else. Playing minimum viable Skyrim really is an exercise in prediction more than anything else. Once we're inside the tower, everyone just stands around doing nothing for a while, presumably because they want to stick around for the barbecue. But eventually, they do get their asses back in gear, and we head up to the top of the tower to find that the barbecue has come to us. I'm actually going to shut up for a bit and leave this section of the run at real-time speed, just so you can suffer as I did. Enjoy. Did you enjoy? Anyway, now that we're at the Keep's entrance, we'll go with Hadfar, because apparently we're a good little kitty cat prisoner who follows the instructions properly. Now we get another loading screen, wasting another three minutes of real time. After the loading screen, we get to wait again. It takes another 25 seconds for Hadvar to follow us into the Keep, apparently. Once he cuts our vines, we get to have fun with actually lighting up with items to interact with them. Pressing R for take all is very convenient here. Now we move on to get to finally use our claws on someone. And those claws are definitely useful, unlike any of the equipable weapons. The unarmed claw attack is normally very fast, but on a minimum viable system, it legitimately takes about 5 seconds for a mouse click to attack. You can imagine what happens to a sword swing. But if you think we got it bad, the AI enemies have it even worse. The game is running so slow that they are actually entirely unable to fight. That's not a fluke, it's something that almost everyone in this challenge has experienced. Just watch.
Empire. After making them talk to the paw, we get to move on again. Once Hadvar stopped running into a closed door, at least. More fighting, more of the same. I don't even want to think about how bad lock picking at 4 frames per second has to be. Yes, it is extremely difficult to walk over a narrow bridge when you have to anticipate your movements seconds in advance. Why do you ask? As it turns out, the archers don't actually forget how to fight in the same way that the melee enemies do. So let's just get right past them and pick an even harder fight, lining ourselves up with the tiny lever headbox to bring down the bridge. I'll leave this part unsped up too, for the full running away from spiders at the speed of slow experience. With that, we've actually reached the end of the run. Skyrim is just one loading screen away. One very, very long loading screen. And we're outside. Now to wait for the actual end of quest text. Time.
38 minutes, 56 seconds. That's how long it takes to finish Unbound at 1080p low with an underclocked RV610 GPU. I also did a run at 720p low, where it took 23 minutes 27. For reference, it should take about 15 to 20 minutes to finish it with the game running smoothly. Could I have done better? Well, better at being worse? Yeah, I could have. I even have another machine that I did exactly that with. On the ThinkPad T61, with its GMA X3100 iGPU, and at 1280 by 800 low, I got a time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 8 seconds, with an average frame rate of 3 frames per second. So why didn't I make this video about that? Well, it's been done before. A lot. Like I said in previous videos, GMA X3100 was absolutely everywhere during its time. Basically every entry-level Intel-based laptop used it. As a result, YouTube is full of decade-old videos showing you exactly how to run Skyrim on it. I just didn't feel right following a well-traveled path for a challenge where we're supposed to, verbatim, come up with the most ridiculous machine to run Skyrim on. Even beyond that, there's still plenty of room to go downhill with the CPU. The Athlon 2 and Core 2 Duo chips I've tested are way newer and faster than what is in theory possible. After all, going by the technical requirements, someone could run the game on a processor from around the turn of the century. But I'll leave it up to someone else to do better. After all, I'm not the only one doing this. This is a community challenge spanning this entire week, with several people releasing videos. Be sure to check out the Minimum Bible Skyrim hashtag on YouTube for all the entries. We'd also like to see what you can do. Post a video with the hashtag, or join us on the Pixel Talk Discord server and share your results that way. With everyone's help, maybe we can actually find the Minimum Viable Skyrim Machine. Thanks for watching! Be sure to check out the other Minimum Viable Skyrim videos from other creators as they're released throughout the week. If you like what you see, be sure to let us know. If it works out well, we may do something bigger and better in the future. But until then, see you next time.